Dr. Jason Kim received his dental degree at New York University College of Dentistry. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and the International Congress of Oral Implantologists. He is the co-founder and co-director of the Long Island Implant Center. He is currently a clinical assistant professor at New York University College of Dentistry in the Department of Cariology and Comprehensive Care. He also runs a private practice in Flushing, New York. Please welcome Dr. Jason Kim with a big round of applause. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'd like to thank GDIA, Dr. Jin Kim, the organizing committee for the invitation. And it really truly is uh, an honor and a, a privilege to be here to share some of my experiences with you. Um, the title of my presentation is Predictable Implant Dentistry in the Aesthetic Six. And from what you've heard so far in the previous lectures, my lecture might be moot. I mean, um, from the great technology that we're seeing um, with digital and, and so forth. So I am from New York, um, so we do have some nice sunset views as well, just like you do have here in the West Coast in California. Um, this is uh, where we do our, our teaching. So I am part of NYU where we have um, live surgery. It's a continuing education program where participants, as yourselves, would come and they would do live surgery on patients. So it's a two-year continuum where they're treating patients from beginning to the end. So they're doing everything from the workup to the prosthetics, surgical, everything from the beginning to the end. So it's quite um, a program where clinicians can come on a part-time basis to get the experience that they need to get involved with implant dentistry. I am in private practice. I have one practice in Flushing. I had one in Long Island, um, but I decided to go back to school. So I'm actually a, uh, a first year PG resident in Perio at Rutgers. And so I had to give up that practice. So I only have this one practice and going to school as well. So um, again, the title of the presentation is Implant Dentistry in the Immediate uh, Aesthetic Six, Immediate versus Delay. Some of the objectives I'd like to cover in the short amount of time we have is to review some of the principles of immediate versus uh, delayed implant placement, to learn some of the aesthetic evaluations of the face and smile, what we look for, how do we, how do we improve our predictability, and also to understand the criteria for placing implants in the aesthetic zone, because ultimately today in 2018, it's all about the aesthetics. And, and, and then discuss with some cases and applying the knowledge so that we can apply these principles to our clinical practice. So from the previous presentations, I might be kind of taking you back into time without using surgical guides. And so hopefully you'll be able to learn a few things um, uh, through my experiences. If you look at this picture, I think you would all agree with me that this is a pretty aesthetic smile. If we look at the teeth, the soft tissue, the, the lips, I mean, everything is pretty harmonious. And you would say it's a pretty aesthetic smile. So this is what we strive for in a private practice. This is what we strive for for all of our patients, to give them beauty, to give them aesthetics in, in terms of what they want. Now, we can ask ourselves, you know, what would you do if you lost one of your central incisors? Like if you came with your spouse or your partner or someone and they lost one of their central incisors, how would you restore their tooth, right? Some of you may say, leave it alone, right? Because I don't like my husband or wife, right? Some of you may say that, right? But others will say, you want the best possible treatment plan that you possibly can give to, to your patient or to yourself for that matter, right? So how would you restore your case? And Plato has this quote, as we're all aware of, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder, right? We all have a different view of what beauty is. Our patients have a different uh, philosophy or expectation of what beauty is, right? So if we look at these two pictures, we have the West Coast smile and the East Coast smile, right? So I'm glad I can represent East Coast with Dr. Gans here, but, right? <laughs> but I'm kidding, but, you know, we have this gentleman here on the left. For him, he's okay with this. He's okay with having two centrals that are missing, right? So maybe if you're from the Midwest, I hope no one's here from the Midwest, right? Oklahoma or somewhere, but you know, someone like her, absolutely she wouldn't be going without any teeth, right? So we need to do something that can give us predictability that's gonna give us the best possible aesthetic outcome for our patients, right? So who is the more aesthetic patient here, right? So everybody has their own view of what beauty really is. <clears throat> when we look at this, we say restoring the single tooth maxillary central incisor is probably the most difficult procedure in implant dentistry, or any single tooth in the aesthetic zone for that matter. And I'm talking about any tooth from canine to canine. 
And it's not even just implant dentistry, it's general dentistry itself. How many of you had patients, you know, restoring just a single crown, how difficult that is, right? The challenges that we meet in trying to get the emergence profile, try to match the shade, right, for those types of cases. We know that this is very challenging, trying to restore that single anterior tooth to give it the best aesthetics as we can. And if we look at the history, the old traditional protocol we're all familiar with, you know, traditional Brandenburg protocol would say, extract a tooth, wait six months, place your implant, wait another six months, right? So that was the traditional approach, two-stage approach, right? You give it six to 12 months to let it heal, make your restorations, load free, right? You couldn't load this, it had to be, you know, you couldn't apply any pressure to the area, so load free bearing um, uh, healing for, for six months. And that's going back to the old traditional Brandenburg Protocol. And we've learned a lot over the years. Where are we today? Our need, patients need and desire for faster treatment, right? They wanted it done today. They wanted it done yesterday. I mean, living in LA and New York, you know how people are, they want everything done faster, 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 right? But can we as clinicians provide something faster, right? The desire to have something today as opposed to staging and giving them the best results. But can we as clinicians really provide faster treatment? Implant companies as well, they're claiming that you can provide faster treatments. And I warn you, you know, we can't really listen to what the companies tell us all the time, right? Because we're going against mother nature and biology. So we really need to factor in all the different um, uh, issues in terms of uh, getting the best possible result. So when we look at immediate implant placement, we're going to compare this to the delayed approach. And some of the advantages of immediate implant placement, as we're all aware of, is the total treatment time is reduced. Right? So what does that mean? That means the overall number of patient visits is gonna be reduced. And how many of your patients really like going to the dentist? I mean, honest, how, if you were a patient, how many times do you wanna to go to the dentist? We saw from the previous lecture, you know, the number of visits for denture fabrication can be reduced from 40 to six. How much happier are the patients, right? So less patient visits. And plus you get higher patient acceptance from that, right? So patients are more willing to accept that type of treatment. So less surgeries involved. If you can do immediate placement, that just eliminates the number of surgeries, the number of uh, anesthesia you need to inject, the number of uh, uh, post-operative complications that you, patients will go through. So there are advantages. We get to preserve some alveolar bone, provide support for the peri-implant tissues, right? Provide and maintain papilla height, gingival architecture. So these are all advantages for doing immediate implant placement. And we know that some of the disadvantages, what are some of the disadvantages? Obviously, the biggest disadvantage is getting implant failure. I mean, how many of you had implants fail after doing immediate placement? I mean, I did, right? And I'm sure many of you have also. Unpredictable gingival recession. Now, do we know exactly where the soft tissue is gonna wind up after we place our implants, right? I don't know if we completely know 100% where that soft tissue is gonna wind up. So we can say it's unpredictable, right? How much bone resorption are we gonna get? Because we know if the bone resorbs, soft tissue is going to follow. And as a result, that leads to soft tissue recession. So are these predictable? We don't know these answers. Right, so if you look at this question, if uh, this patient over here, I would ask you, which is the implant? So if I did a survey in the room, if you could raise your hand, how many of you think number seven is the implant? Anybody think number eight is the implant? How about number nine? A few more. How about number 10? Number eight, what about the lowers? You can't really tell, right? Okay, all right, a little bit more of a smile. Now, now which one would you say was the implant? Seven, eight, nine, 10? Nine and 10, we got this nine and 10 over here somewhere. We should include this as part of the raffle, right? So, all right, so some say nine, some say 10, some say nine and 10. Now, which is the implant? I think it's pretty obvious which is the implant, right? Right, so we can say and classify this as being both an aesthetic and implant failure. And we look at this and say, now we have a problem. Right, so when we look at this case, there's a lot going on, right? A picture's worth a thousand words, right? So <clears throat> with this type of a case, if you look at it close up, there was actually really two implants, right? So whoever said nine and 10, uh, go to, we gotta tell dentists, you gotta get, get a, a, a prize for that. So both nine and 10, were implants, but the results are completely different, right? The com results are completely different. So why, why is that? Why did that happen, right? So we need to ask ourselves, you know, how did this happen and what can we do to prevent this? 
Were they done at the same time? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. So I'm going to walk you through this case. So this is actually my own case that I'm going to walk you through. And you guys know what the difference is between a failing and an ailing implant is? An ailing implant is yours, right? But if it's someone else's, that's a failing implant. <laughs> right? So this is going to be an ailing implant. Right? So this is my case, my implant. So we're classifying this as an ailing implant. So the history of this case was she's a 40-year-old female. Um, she was an executive at a bank. She received a promotion, and she wanted to go celebrate with her colleagues. So it's Friday night. They go to dinner. They have a nice, lavish dinner. They have some drinks. You know, but the night's still young in New York City, right? The night, city never sleeps. So they go for second round and third round of drinks. And by the time late evening came, about 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, she had a little too few drinks. She fell, and her face met the concrete floor. So that's what you're seeing over here. You're seeing remnants from the concrete on those teeth, right? So if we look at the radiograph, this is how she presented. So she calls me up Saturday morning. Dr. Kim, I have an emergency. I had an accident last night. Can you see me? And this is Saturday morning, and I'm booked with patients. I said, you know what? All right, come in. We'll squeeze you in. We'll see what we can do. So in between patients, I'm trying to see her and treat her, and I'm trying to come up with a treatment plan. So what do you propose, and how do you handle this type of a case? Now, this was done in 2007, if you recall the date that I showed you. So that was prior to all this immediate implant placement. That was probably the hot topic of, the, of implant dentistry, immediate implant placement, immediate implant placement. So I'm like, hey, you know, clinicians are presenting on this. They're doing this type of treatment, and they're seeing some great results, so let's do this. So I wanted to do immediate implant placement. And we can see it's pretty obvious, tooth number 10 is practically of all side of the socket. So we knew that was going to be um, extracted. So here's the proposed treatment plan. We're going to do emergency root canal for tooth number nine. We're going to build it up with composite to try and save that tooth. We'll extract number 10. We're going to immediately place an implant. And then we're going to also provisionalize at the same time. That was the treatment plan that we proposed to her. And she agreed and accepted. Remember, this is before the advent of all this digital technology. right? So in hindsight, maybe with digital guides and, and, and digital surgical guides and digital workup, you know, we could have had a much better result. But in any event, this is the proposed treatment plan that we presented to her, which she agreed to. So we did extraction. Now, if you're taking photographs, this is where I learned the most from my cases. And this is, I would say, a great educational learning experience from these failures. That's where you gain the most experience and where you learn the most from it. So if you were to critique this, what would you say? Right? It's too buckly positioned. Right? Obviously, it's too buckly positioned. Right? So, I encourage you to take photos, and especially now with the fellowship with the GEDIA, you know, these are great learning cases. And so, we can definitely criticize this and say that the implant was probably too buckly positioned. But in any event, we were able to get primary stability, place my implant, I wanted to provisionalize at the same time, so that's the temporary abutment, provisional abutment, and then we also grafted the buckle plate because the buckle plate was fractured. There was a, a, like a green stick fracture. So we grafted it with some mineralized cortical cancellous bone, membrane, and then sutured it up. So remember, this is all seeing patients in between on a Saturday morning. So here's the before, and here's the after. And it's not looking too bad. So we did emergency root canal. We did an implant placement for number 10, a, a provisional abutment with her tooth as the provisional. So I just cut off the root, hollow ground out the tooth, relined it, and used it as a provisional. So that's the best provisional that a patient can have, her own natural tooth. So this is how she walked out at the end of about probably, I would say, I want to say maybe five hours, because I was seeing her in between patients. So it was a long morning for her, but I felt good. I felt good because we provided something, you know, that day we were able to take care of the emergency needs. And, uh, you know, I thought, wow, immediate implant placement, that's what everybody should be doing. That's what I thought. So one week post-op again, uneventful healing, looks pretty good, you know, because of the temporization, soft tissues healing around the, the, um, the uh, or her tooth as a temporary. So soft tissue healing is looking pretty good as well. So I'm really feeling good. Now two months later, a patient comes back and here's the post-op, right? Still, not too bad. Soft tissue healing, maybe a little inflamed and so forth because of maybe some plaque, but we know that it's looking okay. But during the two months, she still kept having symptoms with tooth number nine, right? She kept complaining, it's still a little bit sensitive. So we felt that, you know, it was, even with root canal therapy, the tooth was failing. So what was the obvious choice? What are we going to do? Number nine, um, I did not notice any fracture. Um, I don't recall any fracture. But, you know, what we did for number 10, I said, 
why not we do the same treatment for number, 10, uh, for number nine? Seems like it worked well for number 10, so why don't we provide the same treatment for number nine? Right? That's what everybody's doing in implant dentistry, immediate implant placement. So that's what we did. We performed the same procedure. We extracted it, we placed an implant, we uh, placed a provisional abutment and temporized, and that's how she walked out. A couple months later, we're getting ready for a prosthetic phase. So again, another hot topic of, this, of the times was zirconia copings, right? So zirconia copings, we're gonna go with individual crowns, and I'm seeing the finish line. We're almost home free with these two crowns and feeling really good because immediate implant placement saved the day, right? Because that's what it was all about. So December 2007, this is what, uh, on the day of insertion. Not too bad, right? So we got two individual um, zirconia crowns, zirconia abutments, and I'm feeling good because, you know, we got art, we got science, we're merging everything, we got beauty, she's happy, I'm happy, and then we thought the case was complete until, right, she came back for her recall visit, right? Did I, did, to number 11, no, we did not do anything to number, cuspid? Cuspid. 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 I'm sorry. Bruxism. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, bruxism, yeah. So we, you know, night guard at the end of treatment. So I'm not understanding the question, but I can address it. Let me finish the case. <laughs> right, so <clears throat> at three months recall, she comes back. And again, so that's what she presented, right? But we got two completely different results, right? So why did that happen? You know? And I'm saying those weren't the exact letters I used. This was the more the, this is what I really said, you know? And, uh, this is one of those patients where you see on the schedule, you let, your body starts to shiver, right? <laughs> you see her on the schedule, it's like, oh, I don't want to see this patient today. You know, it's like, I know you have those types of patients, right? That you don't, you wish that wasn't here today. You want to see them some other time. So we re attempted to regraft around the implant. That was not successful. So what we decided to do was just remove the implant and then kind of start all over. So we removed it, grafted it, tried to rebuild the bone around it. You know, just because, you know, it failed once. I didn't want it to fail a second time. So we went ahead and just tried to graft as much as we can. And you can see, you know, I'm using titanium reinforced. You know, I'm using a, um, a, a fixed provisional, something that's bonded so that we don't have any pressure. And we need to kind of know what our limitations are. Right? And then this is how she started to present. Right? So what's going on? It's like when things are going bad, we shouldn't follow them. But it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And so this is something that I've created for this patient. And so what do you do with this type of a case, right? We tried grafting, it didn't work. You know, we took out the implant and it's causing more problems. So we need to know our limitations. We need to know when to stop. So we went back, we placed a, actually a smaller diameter implant for number eight, a nine site. Um, we added a little bit more bone and then we went ahead and we finished it uh, as a two unit splinted this way with some pink porcelain. So that's how we wound up completing this case, um, right? So 2010, we inserted. So if we look at the timeline, and again, average smile line, not a, not a high smile line, so it was able to kind of mask some of that uh, pink porcelain. But if we look at the timeline, we started in 2007, and we're thinking immediate implant placement was the way to go, right? And we thought we had something finished, but you know, understanding why this happened and how this can be avoided and prevented and then eventually finally winding up with a prosthesis like this. So we need to kind of ask ourselves what happened. So there's something I did for tooth number 10 that I didn't do for number nine initially. What was that? Not, graft, right. So I grafted number 10 at the time of extraction with implant placement. Number nine, when we did the um, implant placement, I did not graft because I felt that there was, since it was, all the bony walls were intact, we didn't need to graft. So that was one difference. Um, that was one major difference that I felt at the time. So this was actually a, a, a great learning curve for me, and I hope it's not discouraging for you. So I hope you're not discouraged, and I really encourage you not to be discouraged with immediate implant placement, right? Because if anything, we want to try and learn from our mistakes, and which is why we want to share our experiences, and which is why I went through that case to show you some of the, some of the things that we can avoid and some of the things that we can try to, um, uh, try to incorporate so that we can have better predictability. Right, so learning from mistakes. And tr for this case, it was a tremendous learning experience because I was able to understand what I needed and when, what, I, what I should have done to make it more predictable to get the, the aesthetic and prosthetic results for this patient. 
And if we look at the literature, immediate implant placement is not something new. It's been around. In 1970, Schultz uh, had uh, uh, introduced immediate implant placement. Again, in 89, 94, implant, immediate implant placement was being done. But during those times, they were reporting on clinical success, not, not really addressing the aesthetic concerns. Right? So, but we know in the literature, if we look at the literature, you know, Peter Worley uh, from <coughs> California published a paper in two, uh, 1998, and he talked about single tooth replacement in the aesthetic zone with immediate provisionalization. He found 100% success, 100% survival. Again, Joe Kahn and his crew from Loma Linda, right? He studied 35 patients, and he found that the results of this study suggest favorable implant success, peri-implant tissue response, and aesthetic outcomes can be achieved with immediately implant placement and provisionalization of anterior single uh, teeth, right? So we know it works, because we've learned for over the years of what we can do. And when we look at immediate provisionalization, it's really to help maximize the aesthetics, as we've seen in some previous uh, presentations. We get a fixed temporary, helps to maintain the soft tissue architecture, facilitating contouring, right, so it will get the emergence profile. And just psychologically, if patient's not having to wear something removable, so patients are more willing and more um, accepting of that type of a treatment. If we look at this case, tooth number eight was extracted and provisionalized, um, two unit was splinted, some of the advantages of being able to do media implant placement, you know, is we get a fixed temporary, helps maintain the soft tissue architecture, right, to help shape, uh, sculpt the emergence profile, not having to wear um, a removal appliance. And also it gives, helps us uh, understand, you know, the pros and cons of flapless versus flat, right? But understanding that when we do provisionalization, there cannot be any type of micro movement with that provisional, right? So you want to cement it with a permanent cement. Or better yet, the better option is really doing a screw tame provisional. Right, that's probably the best option for temporization and, possibly, and even the uh, final restoration as well. And then giving it protected occlusion, meaning no contacts in any excursive uh, interferences. So when can we do immediate implant placement? Usually in cases where we have unrestorable crown root fractures, uh, no infection, and I put an asterisk because we're seeing cases where even with a peripheral pathology, we can clean it out and we can still go ahead and place our implants. Um, as long as there's no alveolar bone damage. From the previous case that I showed you, I think that was another condition of, of treating implants uh, immediately in trauma cases. I think you need to be careful of, with patients who've had trauma to the bone in terms of remodeling. They undergo uh, remodeling differently when there's trauma. So understanding that with immediate implant placements, I think uh, can help prevent some of the complications that we've seen. Versus endo treatment, crown lengthening, post core buildup, crown fabrication, that's probably a guarded prognosis long term at best, right? As opposed to doing a single tooth implant. So, Periodontally involved teeth, short roots, failed root canals, these are all indications of being able to do immediate implant placement. So when we look at the aesthetic zone, we need to evaluate and diagnose and treatment plan accordingly. It's all about the proper diagnosis and treatment planning. And when we do aesthetic zone evaluation, what's the one thing we have to look at is the smile line, right? Is it a high smile line versus a low smile line? We want to look at the gingival biotype, gingival form. Understanding do we have a thick biotype or a thin biotype? Gingival margin heights, right? The predictability factor. Do we know where the soft tissue is going to wind up? Right? These are factors that we have to take into consideration, right? Tooth shape and size and so forth, and occlusion as well. Right? So when we look at the aesthetic zone evaluation, this patient also had an implant placement, right? So which is the implant? Number eight, nine, or ten? Right? Some say ten. Some of you may say nine, right? But if we look at the radiograph, clinically this is a success, but clinical success, but aesthetic failure, right? But in his case, for him, he was okay with it because all he wanted was a tooth. For him, aesthetics wasn't a concern, right? And it goes back to beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. For him, he just wanted something that was going to give him a tooth in that missing space. It, it didn't matter about the aesthetics, right? Maybe you can ask your patients to grow a mustache, help mask some of the right, aesthetics, right? <laughs> in New York, we can do that, right? But understanding, you know, how do we plan and diagnose our cases uh, appropriately, right? So that means we need to begin with the end in mind, right? Stephen Covey's famous quote, must begin with the end in mind because we have to understand that implant dentistry is prosthetically driven. And I think you're seeing from all those uh, presentations how it has to begin with the prosthetics. It has to begin with the final restoration, right? It has to begin with the final goal in mind and understanding that it has to be top-down dentistry and then doing the surgery because the surgery is the easy part. Right? Implant dentistry is, is prosthetically driven. It's a prosthetic modality with a surgical component. Because the surgery itself is not all that difficult in terms of drilling a hole in the bone. 
but it's understanding where are we going to create the osteotomy to give us the best possible result for the aesthetic and, and clinical um, result that we're looking for for the patient. Right, so it has to be about treatment planning. And there's a rule of P that we follow, which states, pre-treatment planning prevents prosthetic problems. And I'm sure you've run into many prosthetic problems. Right? What are some of the problems that we've run into? Screw loosening, screw fracture, implants fracturing. Right? These are all complications that can probably be avoided if we plan our cases accordingly. Because right? it saves us a lot of headache in the future. Patients, they lose confidence if something goes wrong right? with, with our results. Right? So if we can minimize and avoid some of these complications, it's going to speak volumes in terms of getting us a, um, a referral or having you know, patients that are going to be uh, happy and satisfied with what you provide them. So how do we plan our cases? Diagnost diagnostic models and diagnostic wax-ups. We need to have that so we can see what the final restorations are going to look like, right? What a preliminary view of the final goal is going to be. Understanding from our models and, and wax-ups, what is the teeth going to look like? And then from there, we can go ahead and duplicate our radiographic guides, surgical guides, whatever it is that you need, right? But understanding, we need to envision what the final goal is going to be, what the final restoration is going to be. But also understanding that if we want to do immediate placement, you have to have a backup just in case you can't get the implants placed for one reason or another. You can do all the planning you want, do all the digital workup you want, but if you go in and you place your implants and you can't get primary stability, what are you going to do? You can't send the patient home without a tooth unless they're from the Midwest. I hope no one's from the Midwest, right? But understanding you have to have a backup. So all right, that, allows us to, that allows us to have um, <coughs> uh, predictability. So what are the parameters? Again, primary stability, that's our number one factor, right? We need to have that primary stability if you want to do immediate implant placement. And that means getting about 30, 35 newton centimeters of torque in bone for that implant. And then having a thick biotype, thin versus thick biotype. I think you saw from my previous failure case, the patient also had a thinner biotype, which probably led to a little bit of a recession, right? So thin bone, thin biotype is not a good combination for aesthetics. You're never going to get a good aesthetic result like that. Right? Having good keratinized tissue around uh, the soft tissue as well. Placing the implant to the palate. I think you've heard some of the clinicians, some of the, uh, the um, uh, cases where you want to place the implant to the palate of the socket in order to maximize the stabilization of that implant. And then again, uh, infection free. You know, chronic lesions, peripheral lesions, you can clean it out and can still go ahead and place implants. Other clinicians may not do it. They may want to clean out the area, debride the areas first, and then go back. But for me, if it's a chronic lesion that's been sitting there, I'll debride the area, clean it out, and I'll still go ahead with my immediate implant placement. So criteria for placing immediate implant placement. So I want to go through some of the guidelines. If the buccal plate is intact, we can go ahead with what we call 3D positioning. And then, mind you, this is not using guided technology. This is just, um, just clinical uh, kind of taking you back in time. So you want to get, engage the palatal wall at least four millimeters beyond the apex of the socket. That's going to ensure that you have that primary stability. You want to make sure you follow the incised line angles of the adjacent teeth so that it stays within that bony housing. Make sure you place the implant away a millimeter and a half from the adjacent teeth. That way it gives us the good soft tissue and hard tissue support. And also make, understand that you want to place the fixture at least three to four millimeters below the free gingival margin or CEJ. So we've seen that in the previous uh, uh, presentations as well. And then also keeping at least a minimum of two millimeters of bone on that facial plate. Right? So these steps will help ensure that we have long-term stability and predictability in maintaining the long-term aesthetics for our cases. And I, I actually published this in 2016 in our implant dentistry. <clears throat> so just outlining the steps. So if we look at engaging the palate wall, <clears throat> you want to make sure that you engage that palate wall. So that means you're going to probably need to come in at an angle so that you can engage the palate wall. Because many times when we do our osteotomy, if you go drilling right into the osteotomy, what's going to happen to that burr? Where's it going to want to go? towards the path of least resistance. Right, so that means that implant drill is going to want to go towards the apex of the socket. And if we do that, where's that implant going to wind up? Two facial, right? So we need to engage the palatal wall. And if we look at a skeletal view and, and looking at, um, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, CTs, we can appreciate just the, the anatomy of uh, the roots of the teeth in relation to where the bone is, right? If we look at the relationship, you know, I think Dr. Uh, Gantz had mentioned, right, the triangular bone, where is that? Right? So the bone is over here. There's not much bone over here. And if we place the implant going along the long axis of that tooth, it's going to be in its wrong position. Right? So we would need to minimize and avoid those complications. Right? Again, a different tooth. Again, looking at buccal wall, there's not much there. Not much there. 
right? So understanding that we need to place our implant more to the palatal aspect of the socket to engage uh, uh, primary stability uh, for our immediate placement implants. If we look at the studies, Hoin Buzz paper in uh, 2010, he states that for anterior sites, the mean width of the buccal bony wall was only 0.8 millimeters. So that means it's only, it's less than a millimeter thick. And we can appreciate that from the skeletal view of how thin that buccal wall really is. And I'm sure many of you have taken out anterior teeth. How thick is that wall? It's not thin at all. And if one of the requirements is you want to maintain at least two millimeters of buccal wall thickness, then what does that mean? What do we need to do? You probably need to graft around that implant, right? You want to graft so you can have that bony support. So if the minimum criteria of buccal bone width is two millimeters, then that means augmentation procedures are going to be needed to be able to achieve adequate bony contours around the implant and to maintain long-term aesthetics for that case, okay? If you don't split ridge posteriorly, it's probably a millimeter, millimeter and a half. But understanding that favorable facial bone thickness from Spray's article in 2000, 1.8 to 2 millimeters minimum of facial bone thickness. Right? And we can appreciate understanding what we need to do in terms of where do we place our implants, right? To get the best possible long-term um, successful outcomes. If we place it along the palatal aspect of the uh, socket, we know that we can go ahead and restore this as either a screw retained or cement retained. If we place our implant in, into the palatal socket, yet the angulation is off by even a few degrees, we know where that's gonna wind up, right? So if we understand what the final goal is going to be, then we can understand where the implant needs to be placed and how we need to place that implant in its proper position in relation to the socket, right? So that means if it's too, too buccal, or even if it's angled too buccal, then it's gonna be in a wrong position, depending on what the final restoration is gonna be. So you need to understand if are you gonna restore this as a screw retained or a cement retained. So in the posterior areas, it may not be an issue, but certainly in the anterior segments, we need to know that from the beginning so that we can plan our cases accordingly. Because we know if we change this angulation by just even say three to five degrees, it changes the whole direction of how that prosthetic result is gonna be. Right? So that means we can only restore these cases as a cement retained crown. Right? So that helps us to understand that we need to place it more to the palatal aspect and also angle it um, more towards the lingual. Right? So following the inside line angle, the second criteria, we want to stay within the bony housing right? so that we can maintain uh, bony contours around that implant. Third criteria, placing the implant at least a millimeter and a half away from the adjacent teeth on both sides, mesiodistally, right? so that way it gives us the emergence and the support, soft tissue support uh, for the uh, long-term aesthetics uh, results. Placing the head of the fixture at least three to four millimeters below the free gingival margin or CEJ, right? So that way it gives us that running room. We've heard a presentation earlier is talking about emergence profile and running room, right? So placing it three to four millimeters below, but I think the most important criteria is maintaining at least two millimeters of bone facial to the implant body. So that means we're gonna have to graft, right? And the question has been, right? So do you graft or not graft, right? Dr. Tarnow states, you know, that gap distance, if it's two millimeters or less, that there is no need to graft. Right? But if it's greater than two millimeters, that you definitely need to graft. But so the question is, if you only have, say, a millimeter or a millimeter half gap, do you graft or not graft? For me, I graft all my sockets. And I learned from my experience from the immediate failure case that I'm going to graft inside and I'm going to graft on the outside as well. So that means I'll raise a slight flap so I can graft on the buccal aspect as well. But I want as much bone as I can to support that implant to give me the, the successful long-term results for both aesthetics and, and, and uh, uh, function. So choosing the correct implant in the past, it used to be that you wanted to place the largest diameter implant in the socket, right, so that you can maximize stability. But we know that's not true because we know that placing a wider implant, a larger diameter implant, is actually more harmful, right, to the, to the, uh, to the case, right? From my example, with number nine site that failed, I had initially placed a larger diameter implant, a 4.7 diameter implant, right? But that also probably contributed to failing, being too large. Right, so then we change it to a 3.7 diameter implant. So understanding that we want to place a narrow diameter implant to engage the walls and so that we can maintain also that two millimeters of bone to the buccal plate. Right, so that means I will not place anything larger than a four millimeter diameter implant. All right, so here's a clinical case, tooth number nine with large diastomas, uh, failing, periodontally involved, atraumatic extraction with no flap elevation. Um, without flaps, then we know there's better healing, less swelling and so forth, so it helps maintain and preserve the interproximal papilla, and just making sure that we can maintain that buccal plate. Again, critiquing my implant placement is probably angled to buccal, right? So if I wanted to restore this as a screw retained, I couldn't, right? Just because of where the position of that implant is. 
So this is a cement retained restoration, right? So again, <clears throat> immediate implant placement, provisional abutment, and acrylic temporary fabricated, cemented, and then patient walks out kind of with a temporary at the day of surgery. We did some veneers, but again, you can see, see this long clinical crown, right? Does it work? So far, it's been, it's been working pretty good. So again, case selection, patient had a low smile line, right? So he wasn't showing a lot of gingiva, so low smile line, case selection, right? So this is 2003, I did this case. Here's the radiograph, and then this, this was taken recently, 2018. So it's being maintained, so it can be done and maintained and, and still be successful. Here's a tooth uh, fractured in the apical third, number eight. Immediate implant placement, 3.7 diameter, right? Learning from previous experiences, I don't want to put a large diameter. Again, provisional abutment in place. Using the patient's tooth as a provisional, section the root off, hollow ground out the tooth, reline it, cement it, patient walks out the way he walked in, right? So that's the best provision that we can give our patients, right? So, but understanding that it can be done and keep it out of occlusion. This is the previous case that I showed you, it was presented with the internal resorption. I'm just going quickly because of the sake of time. Section the tooth, atraumatic extraction, right? Immediate implant placement. If you notice, this is actually a wide body. This is a 4.7 diameter implant. Again, this is one of my early cases. Again, provisionalization with temporary abutment, and then provisional cemented, and keeping it out of occlusion, right? So non-functional provisionalization, right? No interferences in lateral excursion and protrusive movements whatsoever. So keeping it out of occlusion. And when we post op so when we do these types of cases without raising a flap, again, no post-operative pain, there's no swelling. Patients are much more comfortable, have a much better experience, and it also helps maintain the soft tissue profiles, right? The emergence profile helps maintain that. And that's what we're looking for so that we can convert this to the final prosthesis, all right? And that's because of flapless surgery. Again, low smile line. So you see the current theme that I'm, I'm what's going on with my cases. I'm picking the cases that's gonna give me predictability. Low smile line is going to give you that predictability in terms of aesthetics, right? Unless they come and raise their lip up and say, Dr. Kim, it's a little off, right? But you want to do what you can to try and minimize some complications. So low smile line and uh, choosing the right cases and uh, diagnosis and treatment planning properly. So immediate placement, again, even though this was a 4.7 diameter implant, probably had the bony support around that implant, right? So, and this is going on 13 years. And he knows that this is just, it's just a matter of time before we do that. And what would I do differently for this case? I'm gonna add bone graft on the facial as well, okay? So this is a delayed approach. Understanding what the final restoration is gonna be. Understanding what, where the bony contours are gonna be. So this is what we're looking for. <clears throat> Understanding implant placement where it needs to be. Three to four millimeters below the free gingival margin, right? Just measuring out, you know, positioning where it has to be. Right, guide pin in place, <clears throat> temporary abutment, Immediate provisionalization, again, had a wax up, so I know what the final crown wants to look like, I know what the final restoration should be, allowing that to heal, and then after four months, we get nice emergence profile that we can now just take to final restoration. So with provisionalization, it's gonna help sculpt and shape and maintain the soft tissue architecture for our final restoration. And then making sure we have that thick, healthy periodontium. Nice, thick, healthy periodontium, custom abutment in place. This was before the, the uh, use of zirconia and so forth. That's what I would probably do today, using um, zirconia abutments um, and so forth. So CAD CAM technology, that's what I would do today. But this is the final restoration, right? So single tooth crown, final restoration. Some may say the marginal heights of the gingiva may be a little off, but maybe a little bit low, but we can remove that later. So leave it alone, let the soft tissue mature and heal, and then if we need to, we can always take away, because it's easy to take away. It's hard to grow back, right? So you want to leave that alone. So we can look at this as being both an aesthetic and prosthetic success, okay? And then we know from Joe Kahn's studies, what he's doing is, is for better soft tissue maturation, um, subepithelial connected tissue graft. And this last case, what I'll do is walk you through. <clears throat> Patient presented chief complaint tooth number eight. She was missing tooth number seven. So, uh, number six was built up with some composite. Um, midline is off. And basically it was um, number eight that was failing. She had root canal treatment on number eight and she was symptomatic. So the proposed treatment plan was to immediately uh, place an implant after extraction of number eight and provisionalize at the same time. We're gonna crown number six. We're gonna cantilever a pontic off of number eight so that we can kind of close the gap. And then we're gonna veneer as nine, 10, 11, and 12. That was the treatment plan which she accepted. 
Here's our CBCT. We understand the importance of why we need to take CBCTs. And again, appreciating just the amount of bone that we have or that we don't have around the roots of those teeth. And what we need to do in order to have predictable placement for implant. We know where that implant needs to go. Right, so we went ahead, we extracted. Extracted implant, extracted the tooth, implant placed. You can see I'm placing a, a narrow diameter. I'm not placing anything larger than a 4.0. This is a 3.7 uh, dentist implant. Again, temporary abutment in place. I'm grafting this, the gap around the implant, right? So bone graft and PRF membrane, right? And then he, I don't know if you heard of uh, the poncho yet, Dr. Sohn's poncho technique. So PRF poncho over the temporary abutment so it can help uh, maintain and mature the soft tissue and then cement the provisional place. So here's our uh, pre-op uh, uh, CBCT, guide pin in place. Implant, what I did was try to place the implant a little bit more towards the midline because their midline was off center. So we placed it as close to the midline as well. And now we can really appreciate that buckle plate there, right? Just being less than one millimeter and then grafting between the implant and bone, uh, between the implant and the buckle plate. So grafting with some bone so that we can maintain that for longevity. All right, so, and that gave us an ideal, uh, <coughs> excuse me, an ideal placement, allowing us to have three millimeters of facial bone, right? So that minimum two millimeter criteria is certainly being met by placing our implant properly and choosing the right diameter implant for that case. Again, just understanding where that implant needs to be placed. And then immediate temporization. Again, making it shorter just to keep it out of occlusion and then trying to maintain some of the um, soft tissue profile Here's the panoramic, just showing you how we're trying to place a cantilever. Number six was built up a composite, so we're trying to recontour that with a crown. So understanding we have three, three and a half millimeters of space from the implant to the bone. And then here's the final restoration. And then understanding that we did some crowns and then aesthetics and <clears throat> main point is really, it's about the bone around the implant, right? Without the bone, you're not gonna have the soft tissue support, right? So 2014, that's how she walked in. Here's the after, we were able to maintain and give it better aesthetic results. And then this was just taken um, last week when she came in for recall. So everything's still being well maintained and aesthetically uh, she's pretty happy. So we went from this to this, all right? So in summary, we understand that it all comes down to diagnosis and treatment planning properly, right? Choosing the right appropriate cases for your immediate implant placements. And if we can temporize at the time of implant placement, that's the best for our soft tissue profile, soft tissue emergence, if, to try and maintain and give it the best emergence as possible. Understanding we need to follow protocol, right? Understanding the guidelines, positioning, where in relation to the CJ, where in relation to the adjacent teeth, and how much bone that we need you know, for that long-term support, right? So ultimately, it's really about planning, scanning, and really planning some more, right? Because it's always about having more information than less information and being surprised. Or alter alternatively, today is probably maybe planning digitally and using a surgical guide to get that proper placement, right? If we look at the studies, right, immediate versus delayed, we know they work. There really is no difference between immediate versus delayed. The success rates are, are similar if it's done properly, right? But understanding how we can maintain and minimize some of those complications. I know it was a quick presentation, but due to the time, I hope uh, I was able to share some of, uh, some of my experiences and insight into immediate implant placement, kind of going back in time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jason Kim.